Hello everybody, Ben Rogers here, the Raptors Digest, reacting to, I guess, an older bit of news now. The Toronto Raptors drafted Malachi Flynn in the first round this year. Yes, Riker, we had a first round pick this year with all the Raptors news that went on. We sort of are only getting to it now, but this guy, Malachi Flynn, looks like he could be a really good prospect for the Toronto Raptors, Riker. Ben, he's almost a carbon copy of Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Vliet. He's a player that excels on the defensive end. He can stroke the three. He shoots at an incredibly high clip. In his three seasons of university college basketball, he shot five threes per game, seven and a half threes per game, six and a half threes per game. He's not, he's not afraid to shoot. And so those two things translate really well to the NBA in general, but specifically the Raptors. This guy's fun, Ben. And funny enough, I think he's the tallest of Fred Van Vliet, <laughs> Kyle Lowry, and himself at six foot one. So we, we finally have a tall front court player or backward player. Backward. <laughs> but but uh yeah, Malachi, he's definitely a sort of Raptors esque pickup. Throw stats on the board now for his career. Average fourteen points over his four year or three years of college. He redshirted at one season, but as you mentioned, he's a guy that can knock down threes. He's a good slasher. He's pretty athletic. Obviously, like most of the point guards that we sort of draft, still a bit undersized, even though he's a bit taller than uh, Fred and Lowry. But the one really surprising thing about Malachi was his defensive end of the floor because, you know, most small guards, that sort of thing, you when you draft a small guard, usually you're sacrificing on the defensive end to get a guy that can knock down threes, do all the things that you just mentioned, Riker, lead a team and stuff. But similar to Lowry and Fred, he's another scrappy guy that can really mix things up on the defensive end. I believe he won Defensive Player of the Year in his conference. So he's a player that really does everything well-rounded. And as Bobby Webster came out and said, he was really surprised to see this guy land so deep into the draft. I believe it was the 28th, 29th pick the Toronto Raptors had. So... Do you think this could be another guy that sort of shocks the world and really sort of outperforms his draft position? Obviously, Fred was a guy that was undrafted. Lowry was a guy that was drafted late into the, the first round in his draft. I think it was in 06. I think it was the Bargnani draft. So do you see his style player really being a guy that's a diamond in the rough-esque player? Yeah, well, it's very clear why he got passed on. The, the typical mold now for NBA players, yeah, you want three, you want D, but you want big, you want long, you want athletic, and he's not part of that sort of recipe. But that's, I mean, that's the place where you see guys, and I'm, I don't, I'm not going to throw out a Steph Curry comparison. <laughs> I'm just going to say that guys like that are sometimes passed on because their athleticism isn't at the rest of the draft class. But if this guy, in you're right, he, was t he took home the defense player of the year honors in the mountain or the West Mountain division. If this guy, point guard, is taking home defensive player of the year, I mean, you got to be doing something right. He's averaging almost two steals per game. That, to me, is going to translate fantastically well. He's going to get minutes, you know, because it's pretty pretty deep, I would say, at that two position. you got Fred, you have Norm, you have Matt Thomas. You have a ton of guys competing for minutes. But at that point guard spot, it's really just Lowry and Malachi. If Correct me if I'm, I'm forgetting somebody here, Ben, but he's going to have the opportunity to get run, and we know how fast players can develop when they play on the Raptors under an amazing system. Best GM in the league, best coach in the league, Ben. Well, that's the thing I wanted to bring up because as with guys like Lowry and Fred, as they started their careers, they didn't really have an opportunity to, to excel. Fred obviously got it his second season, but didn't play much in his rookie year. Lowry obviously playing for the Grizzlies, bounced to the Rockets, got some run with the Rockets, but was really given the keys to a team when, honestly, after he was traded to the Raptors, and then the Raptors ended up moving on from Jose Calderon. So this style player, you know, they, they haven't really gotten the, the reins. And opportunity with the Toronto Raptors is going to be really interesting to look at next season because... You know, rookies, it's been noted in the past, the Toronto Raptors like to have a lot of talented guys sort of sit on their bench for a while, develop in the 905, sort of see how everything works, works amongst the culture, because obviously we have high expectations going into next season as well. So, you know, we're not ready to sort of start developing young guys, but being a four-year guy in college, you know, he, he looks like a player that's pretty developed and can come in. And, you know, you brought up Lowry and Fred. Both of those guys are natural point guards. Obviously, Fred plays the two because he's in the starting unit. But, you know, we saw a guy like Terrence Davis last season get a lot of minutes as an undrafted uh, uh, as an undrafted rookie. Uh, 
playing in that sort of same combo guard position. But you mentioned Matt Thomas. Patrick McCaw is another guy that can sort of play that point guard role. And we just saw news come out today that the Toronto Raptors have picked up Terrence Davis's option. And we're not really sure what's going to happen with that scenario, that sort of you know, sit- ongoing situation. Obviously, he's, uh, for people that don't know, he was charged with uh, with assault. So he he's waiting to be, he's waiting for his sort of, to see if he's actually guilty or not. So the Raptors will have to move forward with that situation. But assuming TD is going to be on the roster going forward, do you think he'll be able to edge out minutes there from a guy that really sh- showed he can play play well throughout the last year of the regular season? Yeah, I mean, there's there's no reason to say why he wouldn't be if if he performs, because you have to be able to hit a high consistency. Ben, if you're coming in at the point guard spot, you have to be able to hit the three at at least thirty five percent. I would say you have to relatively well sort of navigate uh, from a court general position, and if you're able to get into the paint, then that's an added bonus. So I. I, I could see I, I don't know I don't really know enough about this guy's game yet to to make a gauge on whether or not he'll beat out the other guys that are maybe contending for those backup minutes but I think it seems like he has the tools to be able to do that then yeah I think that the big thing with this guy especially when comparing him to to a guy like Terrence Davis and obviously that's a tough comparison because we don't even know if he'll be on the roster is he's a better natural point guard at all indications all articles bring up how he's really a leader he's really an on ball guy and Obviously, Fred Van Vliet playing the two. We didn't really have a natural backup point guard last season. Obviously, when Lowry's to the bench, sometimes Fred played that role. And McCaw can play that position, but he's more of a wing guy in the NBA with his height and sort of size. So, And Terrence Davis, obviously, is a combo guard, more of a score-first player rather than a guy that's looking to facilitate for the rest of the team. So having a guy that can come in and really just quarterback your offense and give you know the starters, Lowry and Fred, a rest is going to be essential, especially when we're going into a season where we're going to need depth. It's noted that even, I think, the first set of COVID cases have already been infecting the league, and the the teams are just getting together right now. The Golden State Warriors had to push back their practices because two guys are are diagnosed with the, the virus. So this season, players are going to be out a lot more than they were in previous years. Your depth is going to be such an integral part to success for any of these teams this season, and having another guy that can sort of quarterback your team, it's going to be essential to to really succeed in a tough Eastern Conference this year, Riker. It, absolutely, it's going to be tough. But what I like, too, is this guy, he's he's low-drafted. He was expected to be higher, so he's going to be playing with the chip on his shoulder. And he's not coming fresh out of college. He spent basically four years in the university system. So it's not like you're getting a raw prospect who needs a ton of time to develop He's consistently shot 35% of whatever from the field. I'm looking at the scouting reports. He's supposedly one of the best pick and roll players in the whole draft class, just in terms of IQ and being able to pass out of different positions and hit players in, in, in their pockets. So this is a guy, you make the point, you need you need the, the, the next man ready to step up, potentially take the helm as the starting point guard in spurts throughout the season. Maybe they're going to be resting Kyle Lowry, maybe due to people getting the virus or even just general injuries. And I think a, a player like this with already proven defensive ability and sort of decent, decent playmaking, I would say, the only thing that's a little bit suspect is the same argument that we'd have towards any of our point guards that they're hesitant or that they're they're not really able to finish around the basket. And of course, if your point guard's not putting pressure on the defense, then it, it makes it a lot harder for everybody else to swing the ball and uh, make their own create their own shots. But I, I, I like what I see from this guy. And you're right, this is this is maybe an abnormal season in that he's probably gonna get run. Typically our 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 rookies don't. They don't get a lot of minutes. They get those burner minutes when you can't quite tell and they they really need a scrape to see if, you know, the arguments around full season. Should we give them 10 minutes? Should we give them 15 minutes? Should they play at the end of the second quarter? This guy is probably going to start right away with 15 minutes per game. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. The the one interesting thing that you brought up, Riker, was he's known as a pick-and-roll player. He's a guy that succeeds in the pick-and-roll. He, he excels in that position. And one guy that we sort of brought in that really excelled in that sort of offense as well was a guy like Jeremy Lin who really had a, a breakout season after dealing coming off of injuries with the Atlanta Hawks when he was signed during that year we won the championship, I believe it was 2019. So 
the Toronto Raptors don't really run a lot of pick and roll. They're more so of a pace and space, you know, swing the ball, have different types of action. So it'll be interesting to see if his sort of game will translate to the Toronto Raptors system. And, you know, we obviously saw it couldn't with Jeremy Lin, but again, his three-point shot was in a place that wasn't doesn't look like it's at the level of Malachi's right now. And the argument that I'll make, too, is that, well, well, well one actually... Jeremy Lin's defense was not that suspicious. He was actually pretty highly rated as a defensive player on the Atlanta Hawks. So I'm not going to go and disparage him, but I think that this guy has the potential to come up with maybe a little bit better defensive prowess just off the jump than Jeremy Lin possibly had. But the second argument is that Jeremy Lin was coming into the system with Gasol, with Ibaka, both players. You you can put Gasol up at the point and have him basically facilitate the offense. You're going to play a lot of having... Serge Ibaka run at that high post or slip outside the perimeter. It's a completely different game this season where I don't think that any of our centers now, centers are power forward, so Boucher, Alex Len, and obviously Aaron Baines, none of them have that ability, I would say, to create things on offense. I don't think you're going to have Aaron Baines running back and forth on, you know, on the high post or sort of on that elbow position pass it down to him and then he's going to either you know do a jab or shoot that mid-range I, I think you gotta you gotta set him up for his shots a lot more Alex Len even more so Chris Boucher even more so than that just how raw he is so I think you might because it's a little bit easier to integrate centers into the offense if you're running them off pick and rolls because you can do whatever you want you can say pick and pop you can you know carry him down to the basket you can look for switches I think it's just easier to do that on guys that aren't at the same skill level as Ibaka or Marcus All. Uh, and this is not me taking away from Aaron Bain's game because I think he's fantastic pickup and I think he's going to do great. But I, I think we could see more pick and rolls just by virtue of what we have to work with now at the four and the five. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Aaron Baines is known as one of the best screen setters in the NBA. So I think Nick Nurse is sort of going to adjust the offense to sort of suit the skills of the, the different roster we're coming into with this season. So I really like that point. And do you think that will sort of help this team going forward? Because Obviously, it sucks that you lose a lot of offensive talent in Serge Ibaka and Marc Gasol. Two of those guys were real focal points of our, our offense when they were out there on the court. Obviously, in the playoffs, they ended up getting brought to the bench, and we did go with more of a guard-oriented lineup, a more small ball unit. But do you think having a bit more pick-and-roll sort of integrated into our offense might get more out of those wing players? Maybe, you know, Siakam could run some pick-and-pop. Do you think that's sort of a good way going forward? And especially when we have, de- well, Lowry's obviously great in the pick and roll. Malachi seems like a guy that can do it. Do you think that'll be sort of a good thing going forward for this team, switching up the offense a little bit? Definitely. And we've ran very high pick and rolls in the playoffs, this most mm-hmm. recent playoffs, but it was multiple steps outside of the, the perimeter. And it was most often it was Siakam setting the, the pick or it was Siakam was carrying the ball up. And then we had one of the guards set the pick, if you remember uh, in, in a lot of different plays that were set. But I think what's nice about this, if you're running Aaron Baines and Kyle Lowry or Aaron Baines and Malachi, Aaron Baines and Van Vliet, is what does it force the point guard to do? To make a move towards the paint. And we know that our guys love to play outside the perimeter, pass it around, go on the ISO. But I think if you're running more pick and rolls, just inherently you're going to have more action moving towards the basket, which I think is something that the Raptors can benefit from. And if it doesn't work, then you're at least you're making the defense collapse a bit and you're you're giving a little bit more space to your shooters like, oh, gee, who's going to come out fire in this season? I know it. Norman Powell is going to be ready to step up. Matt Thomas, Matt Thomas, 99%. You know that those boys are going to be stroking their threes this season. So I think it's a it could only be a positive thing. And it's a very easy trans- or adjustment to make if it doesn't work out just to go back to the system that was already working. But that, that's my thought on it. Yeah, and the, the big thing, too, with Malachi is, the, which was a problem with Jeremy Lin, which doesn't give me the same reservations that we sort of should have had with Lin when he came in, because obviously he wasn't the same player. But Malachi is a guy that, that shoots threes. You you brought it up, Riker. He he shot seven threes a game last season. So, yeah, you know, on a, on a really seven high... And a half in his yep. second last season. I think he was six per game in, this, in, in the Mountain West Conference. Yeah, so like... Which, I will interject before you go on your spiel. It, I don't know the reason. I, I didn't research it enough to know why he shipped from the Pac-12 to the Mountain West, but they were like second last in their conference when he was playing on whatever team he was before. And then when he switches to San Diego State, first in the conference. So definitely 
big move to put yourself in the limelight. Yeah, no, thousand percent, definitely. You know, he's ever by all accounts, this guy is a winner. That's that was the first thing I heard of it when draft night sort of came came out and all those reports are coming through. He's a winner. He's a grinder. He's all those things you're sort of looking for as a in a Toronto Raptors guard. But you know, he's he's a guy as you brought up. He can shoot threes, which was. I think the biggest thing with Jeremy Lin, he, he came in and just really couldn't knock down the three. He had a couple games where the threes were going in, and then you know he dropped 20 points, 25 points, hyped us up a little bit on the podcast, but unfortunately couldn't get it all together coming into the playoffs. So I think he'll be fine for getting minutes going into next year. But Riker, the question I pose to you right now is, What's this guy going to be? Is he going to be a multi-time All-Star like Fred, or hopefully Fred. Fred hasn't made an All-Star team yet. It feels like he should have at some point, but obviously hasn't. But uh, like Kyle Lowry, is he going to be an NBA champion? Is he going to be a multi-time MVP? Or is he just going to be a solid role player, maybe potential starter for, for this Raptors squad? I have a theory that it's hard to be an All-Star if you don't have a dunk package. And you have to give credit to Kyle Lowry because he's leading the Raptors over the past seven seasons to amazing things. So they, they can't pass him up. But otherwise, I think if you don't have a dunk package, it's hard to be an all-star. Uh, so our man's Fred has a significant higher battle that he has to fight than other point guards that are maybe a little bit more athletic, maybe a little bit taller. But I don't know. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold my judgment. I'm going to say that this guy, he's not going to be a flop. Let me put it that way, Ben. I don't know about your thoughts on it, but he no ain't going to be a flop. No nuance. How many All Stars? We're coming back to this in twenty years when we're doing the the Raptors Digest twenty fifth anniversary or twenty third anniversary. <laughs> Three. Three. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh I'll put it at four. I'll put it at four. If it's under, wow, you win. Ball. If it's you're four, just, you're if just it's riding four. my coattails. <laughs> I had three or four in mind before, so we'll see how that goes. Obviously, fact check or check us back now in 20 years when uh, Malachi is probably, we're underestimating him. He's a six time champion, you know, 11 time All Star. I don't know, but you guys are the best for making this far. Uh, check out the Twitter, the Instagram, all the cool stuff. Check out the website. We have articles coming out there left, right, and center. Riker, do you have any last words on Malachi Flynn? I do. Uh, so he is born May 10th, 1998 which is eight days after me, and he has two kids more than I do, which is two kids to my zero. That's <laughs> – well, I'll just sign it off on that, Ben. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs>